Hi everybody, this is Gretchen from the Museum of Modern Art social media team. Welcome to MoMA for Hashtag Museum Week. Um, thanks so much for joining us. We're going to be giving you guys a private tour of Jackson Pollock, a collection survey with the exhibition's curators. And I'm going to introduce them right now. Hey guys. Hi. All right, so introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about the exhibition. Uh, I'm Star Figura. I'm a curator of drawings and prints here at MoMA. And I'm Hilary Reeder. I'm a curatorial assistant also in drawings and prints. And we're here in Jackson Hall in the collection survey 1934 to 1954, which is a show that Hilary and I uh, curated together, which means uh, we selected all the artworks and we um, installed them in a certain way, which we hope will enable people to get uh, a sort of quick um, concise view of Jackson Pollock's entire career from when he first moved to New York in 1930 at the age of 18 until he died in a car accident at the age of 44 in 1956. Um, there's 58 works in the show and the amazing thing is they're all from MoMA's collection. So just using MoMA's collection we were able to tell this complete story about Jackson Pollock and the way um, his career evolved until the end, which we'll see um, the great um, drift paintings, which are his most famous and um, uh, probably most important works. Great. All right, let's move on maybe to the next room and you guys can talk a little bit about some works in there. exciting things about this show is that we have combined prints and drawings along with paintings and um, that's, a, that's a little new for us because we actually haven't shown all of the mediums together in this way before and we think it shows a much more full story of Jackson Pollock's creativity. So these two works are a great example of that. This is a pastel, a drawing um, with, with ink and pastel on it and you can see that in this painting here. He's almost doing the same thing with oil on canvas. You see sort of similar colors of blue ground with um, things that feel like figuration, but they're really nearly abstract. So in this gallery, we're really showing um, his transition towards abstraction, but you can still see some great figuration that was more characteristic of his early work. And so, for example, there's almost something that looks like a snake right here. And you can probably maybe make out a few faces. So in this painting, you really see him moving towards a more sort of all-over um, arabesque abstraction that he would really get to when he started dripping. Cool. Can you show us one of the faces that I, can, I think well, I can see it's some? A little, <laughs> there's one right here. It's a kind of strange face with this weird nose and then this mouth here. There's like a tongue coming out and an eye right there and maybe, in profile. Cool. Maybe, maybe this is another face with a, with a red lips and an eyes, but the thing is, once you start looking and looking for faces, more emerge, and who knows, you know, it's in the eye of the beholder. Yeah, I definitely see that snake. That's cool. Great. All right, and let's move on to this final room. There's plenty to talk about in here. Okay, and I'm going to move to horizontal so we can really get a good look at these works. We just move very quickly through the first two sections of the show. It's set up uh, chronologically. So the first section was the early work. The second section was the sort of transition where he was able to kind of uh, move out of fig figurative or representational work, depicting things in the outside world, and slowly started um, using just line itself in a very abstract way. And then around 1947-48, he had a major breakthrough. And he started um, putting his canvases on the floor and dripping on them with paint from above. So he would uh, use his paintbrushes almost like sticks and load them up with paint and just fling it or drip it onto the canvas uh, on the floor. Um, and so we have a, a few great examples of this type of work in this show, one over here is called the 1A from 1948, and in this one, you can see he's still using uh, oil paint from the tube. So if you look closely, you can see how um, the paint kind of 
sits up uh, in relief on the canvas because he's just like squeezed it out of the tube directly onto the canvas. The other thing that's really um, remarkable about this painting, if you look closely, is you'll see a number of the artist's handprints on the painting. So it's like he is literally putting himself in the painting. And so with this work, instead of depicting something in the outside world, it's really um, a projection of himself. He's putting himself in the painting. And the subject is not something in the outside world, but the subject is the physical act of painting itself. Cool. And Star, do you think people are surprised to see so much color in some of these when you get up close? I think people well, always think of them as being sort of black and white. And oh, that's beige. interesting. Well, there are a lot of different different colors in his work, and the thing is, if you if you start to get get up close, um, it's quite amazing because you see there's so many layers, and that's another thing about Jackson Pollock's work. It's all about layering, like Hillary was talking about with the figuration and abstraction. Like the bottom layer was figures, and then on top he just put a network of lines. And here there's just all kinds of layers, and different colors emerge through um, in those layers. Cool. And then the, the great masterpiece in our collection, probably, you know, I would say his greatest masterpiece of all is this painting, one number 31 from 1950, which is one of his very largest uh, canvases. It becomes almost like a mural. And how, how big is it, Star? It's about 18 feet wide. Okay. And um, the size is interesting because um, he started, he converted a barn. He was living in East Hampton, New York, uh, after about 1945. And there was a barn on the property that he converted into his studio. It's still there, the Pollock Krasner House. You can visit it. It's really fantastic. And um, if you go into the barn, you see where he works. And the size of the room is only a tiny bit bigger than this canvas. So the size of the canvas um, was really only limited by the size of his studio barn. And when you go there, you can still see the drips of paint on the floor um, from the remnants of, of when he was making paintings like this. And, and this, this painting is so big. Uh, when we were working on this show, uh, there was a little moment of panic that everyone had around here because we were like, is it going to fit in these galleries? Because this painting is usually in our fourth floor galleries, which have higher ceilings. Um, and the doors here are quite a bit lower. And in fact, it didn't fit through the front door. We had to bring it in through the back door, and it just made it, when it was tilted on, a little bit um, on its side, with like an inch to spare <laughs> through the doorway. That's awesome. So that was really a great moment when we saw it come in. And can you talk a little bit about what kind of paint he used for these? Right, well he used um, oil in his earlier work, but then when he started making some of these larger drip paintings, he also started using enamel paint, which is sort of like basically house paint. Um, and it has a different viscosity, it's thinner and you can pour it. Whereas oil paint, you know, it comes out of the tube and it's kind of thick. So that, um, you know, really helped him develop this style, which is so fluid. And sometimes he would just puncture the can and sort of start pouring directly from the puncture in the can. And if you look close to the surface here, it's very different from 1A, where you see the paint, um, sort of like ropes of paint sitting up on the surface. Here they really are, it's quite a bit flatter because of the viscosity of the enamel um, paint. And one of the great things about our collection is that you can see how varied Pollock's strip technique was. So in a painting like this, the last painting of his we have in the collection, White Lake, he actually was squeezing the paint out of the tubes, and so the paint here, it almost comes clear an inch off the canvas. Um, so it's really exciting to see how, how he really made his own vocabulary from dripping and squeezing and staining. And um, I have the feeling that this could almost still be wet in the underlayers. <laughs> cool. Um, can you guys talk a little bit about the, the mystery of the fly in this work and sort of the, 
story behind that? The mystery of the fly. Was it, I don't was know what that is. Have, have I, don't, you, I don't know if you're familiar with that. No. What is exciting is that it, it seems that every time these paintings are closely examined, um, something something new emerges. Yeah, I've heard. Uh, I've heard that there. Are, a lot of people seem to think. I don't know if this is an urban legend that there's a fly stuck in one of the canvases that they've been looking for. But I think that's something that people are always looking for when they look at these works, you know, is things like the handprints that you pointed out or yeah. sort of specific I mean, little bits. Well, it could well be, but I, you know, we've looked at these works and talked to different people here, but I've never heard about a fly. But there is a painting in the other gallery where intentionally there's all kinds of stuff encrusted into the paint. Okay. Like, Cigarette and bottle caps and coins and um, you know caps of bottles and different things. So you know it, he was kind of rolling with that kind of stuff. Cool. And can you guys talk a little bit about the conservation of these works as well? Since I know that was a big effort on the museum's right. part. Right. Well, we're not conservators. Right. <laughs> it's different from curators, but we have amazing uh, conservators on staff here at MoMA whose job it is to. Um, um, make sure that the works are preserved, so they make recommendations to us about how to store them and how to keep them in the right climate so that they don't deteriorate, and they also, they're scientists, and so they know how to basically like be like doctors to the paintings and sculptures and, and fix them if they need fixing. Cool. So there's something on our blog about, um, about, about these paintings. I don't know if Hillary, do you have anything more to say? Yeah, we'll definitely check out those blogs because it was a multi-year project to conserve um, both of these large strip paintings um, behind me, and that's really interesting. We have the feeling that some of the colors we were looking at in 1A are maybe a little more vibrant since it was recently cleaned. And then these two um, works on paper here, um, which, which we love and wanted to put together in this way to sort of balance the gallery with the two large strip paintings sort of dominating the other side of the gallery. And if you look closely, you can see there are some orange, maybe on this one it's easier to see, there are some orange marks that almost look like chicken pox. That's called, really oh, sort of close in there. And so that's called foxing. And we're so pleased that these two works were both recently cleaned and they're looking much sharper um, than they were before. So that's another thing that happens with a show like this. You can sort of take stock of what's in the collection and maybe what needs some some attention. So that was one of the great things about 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 thinking about the show. Cool. Can we actually see the painting with the stuff stuck in it? People are interested sure. in looking yeah. at that. Cool. <laughs> called Full Fathom Five from 1947. It's an early drip painting and if you look closely, here's the cigarette. Some of the outer paper has, has gone away so you just see the tobacco. Um, here's like a cap to a bottle. There's some nails here. Here's a washer, you know, like a piece of hardware. Here's a stick. Uh, you keep looking, there's other stuff too. Um, it's really all like encrusted into the paint and that was definitely intentional on Pollock's part and you know it's fascinating as an example of his experimentation to, to just do something like that at this point um, in in our history. And I also think of the objects encrusted in this painting as almost similar to how in certain works um, in, in these transitional years, we're back in the transitional years gallery, of how he would often start with figuration and then impose an abstract grid sort of on top of it. And that just reminds me of sort of starting off with a physical object and then, you know, they become unrecognizable by the layers of paint, which it's sort of interesting to think of him trying out um, moving towards more abstraction. Cool. This is great. Does anyone have any more questions for these guys before we let them go? Any questions about Jackson Pollock or being a curator at MoMA? Let's see if I get any questions. Anything else you guys want to say about sort of uh, what this show means to you personally? Sorry, I know you've worked here a little while. Was this sort of one of your favorites to work on? It was an amazing show to work on because um, Pollock is so so legendary and so important. He's so pivotal in his in our history, really. He's kind of like where early modern art becomes contemporary, and he was so influential on um, 
the younger generations of artists, even artists today, are so fascinated by his work um, when they come here. So, so that was great, just to be able to dive into it, and also, as Hilary said, to be able to mix um, the paintings with the drawings and the prints. We're, we work in drawings and prints, so that's our, our specialty. And, and by mixing them together, I think we really showed a little bit more about how experimental he was, because he was trying all these different techniques and working in sort of unusual ways, as we just saw with all of them. Cool, well, thank you guys so much for taking the time to give us a tour. And um, we have people watching from all around the world. So thanks again for making it accessible to everybody who may not be able to physically get to MoMA. Thank Welcome, you. thank you. <laughs> all right, bye guys.